Come on, Authentic Church. Come on, how many people love Jesus in the room today? Come on, I'm talking about really loving Jesus in the room today. Faith's in the room. And what, what your pastor said is true. And uh, if God doesn't show up, then we're wasted our time. The matter of fact is, I say it this way a lot at our church, is that no matter how many words that I speak, if they're not packaged in the power of the Holy Spirit, then the words mean nothing to the hearts of people. And so I can just tell you this by just simply being with you for the few short moments I have been, that God is up to something in this city. Here's what I know about, here's what I know about God, is oftentimes the greatest miracles that He wants to perform are in the smallest places that nobody's ever heard about. And I can't think of a better move of God to happen if it's not in Parkersburg, I'll cheer you on, Sean, because I believe what God wants to do in a little place called Pontiac, where nobody ever would want to come back and play in a church at, you chose to follow the Spirit of God back to your home place, back to the place where you were born, back to the place everybody knew. Everybody knows the good Sean and the bad Sean, but you said, God, I'm going to be planted in my city. And so I, I, I just believe that if you have that type of faith, that you're just on the brink of what you're going to see God do in this city and maybe multiple locations in other cities, other states. And so here's what I want to tell you is, is have enough faith to believe for the supernatural. Have enough faith, not, not, not just to believe to get by or to fill a room twice or to fill a room three times, but have enough faith that says, God, if we're going we're to bring so many people in that if you don't provide the building up the street, if you don't give us that Kmart building up the street, I don't know what we're going to do. And as soon as you release it into the hands of God, you can step back and say, now you've got to show up. Yeah. Yeah. See, I, maybe I'm in the wrong place, but I've got, I'm full of faith. As long as, if all I do is just go through my, my life and go through my ministry believing for the natural but never asking God to do the supernatural, then people can say your church grew because of your gifting. But the moment that I step out of my way and step out of God's way and usher in the power of the Holy Spirit, then all things can become possible. I'm already preaching and I was supposed to be my introduction. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Sometimes I yell. But here's what I can tell you. Why I yell is because I know where I came from. And had it not been for the grace of God, I still would be there. And so I just wonder in the room, how, how many marks do we have? The story that he shared. I mean, I love I loved the story. Maybe is a dad's way of saying never, I think is what he said. But I think about a way maker. You know what we're all called to be? Way makers. We're all called to, you know what, if you're saved... I'm excited for you. But if that's all God had for you, he'd have already taken you to heaven. The fact that you're still standing in this room today tells me that he saved you so that you could go to work and help save somebody else. And so, and so every hand stretch. This is my custom to pray. Every hand stretch toward heaven if you can. Come on, everybody shut your hands up toward heaven. It's nothing weird. It's not a call. It's a sign of surrender. So we're going to ask God to come and do what only he can do. Father, in this room, God, I feel faith rising. God, I feel expectation is being increased at this moment. God, I pray that I get out of the way. God, that the word you placed in my heart, God, would transfer into the house that I'm standing in today. God, I pray that, that your favor rests upon this place, that, God, you would go before them and you would be a way maker for authentic church. God, I pray for people in the room today that they would come to the understanding, the revelation that they have exactly what they need God, to do what you've called them to do. God, I pray for the leaders of the house, Sean and Lizzie, God, such great, genuine people that have a heart for the city and have a heart for people. God, so much so that sometimes I'm burdened because I'm not loving my people the way that he loves his people and his city. And so I just pray, God, that the people in the room take notice of who, what leader they have leading them. And God, they would begin to honor them in ways that they've never felt before. And I just pray, God, that you keep doing a work right here in Pontiac, God, that would begin to have ripple effects across not only the state, but God, maybe even the nation, God. 
Lord, that you would just begin to do what only you can do, God. In this moment, I pray if there's anybody in the room today, God, their heart is even now beginning to be stirred, that they know that, man, this was a day they shouldn't have came because they're going to wreck their life today, God, by the power of the Holy Spirit. God, I pray for lost people to be found. I pray for bodies to be healed. I pray for marriages to be restored. God, I pray for miracles to take place. I, I pray for restoration in families that the enemy has tried to tear apart, God. In this room today, God, let there be signs and wonders take place place of the power of the living God and it's in Jesus name that I pray and everybody says amen. amen come on put your hands together one time authentic church come on one time just give God your greatest praise come on if he's been good if he's been a good God give him some good praise if he's been a great God give him some great praise but if he's been an amazing God an absolutely amazing God, then give him the praise he deserves in the room today. Come on, I'm talking about an amazing praise. Come on, a praise that you've got to remember where you used to be had it not been for his grace. Ah, uh, you better sit down. i got to preach. High five, seven or eight people. Uh, worship team, you can go whenever you feel like it. Sometimes, man, it's yeah, keyboard, you can stay. Don't you go nowhere. It's like my church, I'll look around, they'll be like ghosts, they're gone. As soon as I tell them, they're gone. <laughs> I'm going to go to uh, a few passages of scripture today, and uh, I, I won't preach long, I promise. Matthew 22 uh, and 2 Kings chapter 4. I really felt like this was the message for, for, for this weekend. I prayed and I talked to Sean about it, and uh, the message that God shared me was the same message that he shared him that he did not preach. And so I feel like this is, this is, this is for you. Somebody say, check the oil. Check, check the oil, check the oil. Matthew 22 says, Jesus responded by telling more stories. God's kingdom, he said, is like a king who threw a wedding banquet for his son, for he sent out servants to call in all the invited guests, but they wouldn't come. He sent out another round of servants, instructing them to tell the guests, look, everything is on the table. The prime rib is ready for carving. Come on, come, and come to the feast, come to the party. For they only shrugged their shoulders and they went off, one to Weta's garden, and another to work in the shop. The rest, with nothing better to do, they beat up on the messengers and then killed them. For the king was outraged, and he sent his soldiers to destroy those thugs and level their city. For he told his servants, we have a wedding banquet, all prepared, but no guests. We have a party, prepared every weekend, but no guests. For the ones I invited, they weren't up to it. For go out into the busiest intersections in the town and invite anyone you find to the banquet. If you have your Bible, circle that. Invite anyone, that's a key word today, anyone that you find to the banquet. For the servants went out on the streets and they rounded up everyone. They laid eyes on the good and the bad, regardless. And so the banquet was on. Every place filled. Second Kings 4, and then we're going to get going. It says, the wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. In other words, she had racked up a debt that she could not no longer pay. Does that sound like any of us in the room today? Elisha replied to her, how, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few, and then go inside and shut the door behind you, and shut the door behind your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. For she left him, and she shut the door behind her and her sons. And they brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. And when all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one but he replied there is not a jar left and then the oil stopped flowing one more time I want to pray father I thank you for this moment that we have God I pray for God my words uh, to be your words God I just pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit Lord to lead me and to guide me God if I say nothing God without your power then we're going nowhere today but I just ask God that I step out of the way and you step in God have your way in this room today let lives be changed let hope be be, be released and faith to become stirred. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. 
and everybody in the room says a amen. Amen. How many people have ever felt uh, God speak to your life, but the moment that he spoke to you or you received the call, you looked them in the mirror and immediately felt like your gift was insignificant? Anybody? But like, like what, what, what you thought God was calling you to, like, like, like your past, like what you have came out of, like so sometimes like what God wants to do is he wants to use the things that most of us want to put in the closet and never bring out. But have you ever felt insignificant before? Like, like why, God can't use somebody like me. Like, that's why Pastor Sean's leading the church. That's why Pastor Lizzie is leading worship, because they're at a better place in their faith journey as me. Has anybody felt insignificant before? Let, let me say it a different way. How many people thought your faith would be different than it is today? Like, you thought it would be different. Like, you thought, like, I'm coming to church now. My family's coming to church now. Uh, I thought my family would be doing better than it is today. I thought it would be different. I thought if my wife and I would have come to church and make church a priority that I thought my marriage that was failing would actually have improved, but, but it seems like the longer that I'm plugged into church and the more faithful I become at church, it seems like, like my marriage isn't getting stronger, but it's being torn apart because after all, you thought it was going to be different. Preacher, I thought, like, uh, I battled an addiction. I was addicted to alcohol, and I thought if I, would got, if I would have gotten saved, if I would give my life to Christ, that, that he would have taken that need for the bottle away from me. And so I did. I've been faithful. I've been coming to church. I've been believing in God. I've been holding on to the promises. I've been giving in the offering. I've been lifting my hands during worship. I, I've been doing everything that pastor's been preaching about, and it seems like the addiction inside of me isn't getting weaker, but it's getting stronger, and I thought it would have been different. I thought if I would have raised my family in church that I, I, I raised my son his whole life rooted in church and I had him in Sunday school and I had him at church on Wednesday night and I had him on church on Sunday night and, and I tried to do my best and I thought like if I raised my son the right way that when he, when he was older he wouldn't depart from it but if you saw my son today preacher uh, you, you would understand why I've got a little bit of a hard heart towards God because I thought my family would be different see because if you allow the enemy to he will talk you out of and convince you that you're failing in your faith when in reality you're succeeding in the journey if, if there's ever a moment it's oftentimes let me let me say it it's oftentimes in the middle of your greatest mess that the miracle of God is produced at the greatest heights and so if you allow the enemy to talk loud enough and he'll talk to you, you know, he doesn't scream like I'm screaming at you. <laughs> he'll come in and push, just plant seeds of doubt in your mind. Things like, man, if your husband really loved you, he would have remembered your anniversary. If, if, your, if your son or your daughter was going to be right, then they would have been at church today with you. And if you were failing, and you, if, you were, if, you were, if you weren't succeeding, then you wouldn't have those thoughts. I don't know about you, but sometimes, like, like I wake up every day and just have to remind myself who it is that I'm following. And see, sometimes the devil talks to me, and, and there'll be moments in my faith walk, even me, yes, even me, that I, I look back to where I used to be, and I often think, man, what would it be like just to go back for a season? And so the enemy's speaking to me. I feel like... Sometimes if I don't share a message like this, maybe there won't be freedom released in the place. But can I tell you that sometimes it's okay to look back. It, sometimes it, it, it's okay to look back at where God brought you from. Because it's in the moment when you look back that you realize how far he's brought you from. And sometimes you just got to put the devil in his place and say, not today, devil. Not today. You can't have my marriage. Not today. You can't have my family, not today. You can't have my mind, not today. You can't have this church, not today. You can't have this city, not today. See, sometimes you just got to put it on the bottom of your shoe to remind yourself where the devil belongs in your life. I don't know if you can see that or not, but I got his name wrote on every pair of my shoes that every place I take. It's not to remind me where he is. It's to remind him where he is in my life. 
Because the last time I checked, he's underneath of my feet. He has no power over me. He has no control over me. And it's a moment where I feel like I'm failing that my Heavenly Father reminds me, no, 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 son. No, 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 you're actually succeeding in your faith. And sometimes there'll be high times. And sometimes there'll be low times. Sometimes I'll be on the mountaintop. Sometimes I'll be in the valley. Sometimes I can feel his presence. And then sometimes I'm asking God, are you even still out there? But this faith is, is a journey. And so I really feel like, I don't, I don't typically like to preach out of, out of my bother, but I feel like God has, has given me a word for, for, for not only my city and not only this city, but I believe a lot of cities in America. And, and the fact is, I had, how, many, how many parents in the room? Is there anything more annoying than kids? <laughs> so annoying sometimes. When, when, when's your all school start? They already started, Sean? Last week, ours did too. I mean, people can just give God a 15 second praise break on that. <laughs> Speaking in tongues, running around my house. Thank you, God, that my kids are gone. But it was a few, a few months ago in summer, I had walked, I came home from work, and uh, we have um, an unfinished basement where we put all of the kids' toys, right? So if they're going to destroy something, let them destroy the basement. Uh, and you know, parents, you know that doesn't work, because what happens? They bring the toys upstairs, and they're all over the living room, too. But anyway, this day was different. I went downstairs to get something out of the, out of the closet, and uh, I walked downstairs, and, and, and I, I, I just took a few steps. And Have you ever just went into a room that looked like Toys R Us exploded? That's what my basement looked like. And I thought, well, I know I didn't make the mess because there's Barbie dolls and all kinds of dolls laying around. And, and so I, I knew that I didn't make the mess. And so I went upstairs and we had a, had a family meeting, come to Jesus meeting. And I had my, had my three kids there. I have two daughters. You have a picture? You can throw that up there real quick. I have three kids. Um, yeah, pray for me. Uh, my oldest in the middle is what I'm going to about ready to uh, share what she said. That's Natalie. Uh, the middle child, she's middle child, redhead, seven years old. Uh, pray for me. She might be pregnant before she's 12, so I need all the grace I can get. She needs Jesus. She's thirsty. That's why I tell her. I said, honey, you're thirsty. Uh, that, that, that personality right there, how she's posing, that was, that's, just, that, that's just her. Pray for me. Uh, and then my son, my son Zion Michael, uh, he's four years old. My wife Heather, they're, they're in Parkersburg now holding down the fort at church. And so anyway, my oldest daughter Natalie, I want to show you a picture. So, uh, she, so I bring them all in and uh, I prayed over my son. I said, boy, I hope he wasn't playing with Barbie dolls again. And so I, so I looked at him. I said, just get out of my face. I don't even want to see you right now. Get to your room. This does not involve you. And uh, so my two daughters were sitting on the couch. And I said, okay, who made the mess? And, and neither of them, you know, how, you know parents, how, the role, you know, how it goes. Like, they don't, they don't admit to anything. And, and finally, uh, my, my oldest daughter speaks up and says, Daddy, I didn't make the mess, so why do I have to clean up the mess? And I thought, man, that's really good. And so I started thinking to myself, because sometimes when you're a preacher, everything that you view and hear is a message that you need to preach. <laughs> and so I thought immediately, it's not, I didn't make the mess, so why do I got to clean up the mess? And I thought to, my, to, 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 my, to myself and the city I'm planning it in, and maybe you all can resonate a little bit with the story today, that I wonder how many people have looked around at the city you're planning in and said, I didn't make the mess, so I'm not going to help clean up the mess. I didn't, I, I'm not the one selling heroin on the street. It's not my son that's addicted to drugs. It's not my daughter that's pregnant uh, before she turns 16. It's not my problem. I didn't make the mess, preacher. So why do I got to clean it up? But I would tell you to look at it from a different perspective. Because if you call yourself a Christ follower, if you are a Christian person saved by the blood of Christ, redeemed by the blood, accepted his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness, then I would tell you that this city that you're planted in, even though you didn't make the mess, God has called you to help clean up the mess that's going on in your city. And so... So, so some of you would say, well, this is not my problem. It's, this, it's not my problem. Well, if you're here today and you don't serve in the house, you're telling your pastor, city's on you, man. It's not my problem. If you're here today and you're not giving in the offering, supporting the local church, you're telling your pastor and God, 
It's not my problem. See, oftentimes, it's, it's Christian people that, 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 that have been reached but don't reach. What I want to tell you is the problem that we have in America today isn't lost people. Stop praying for lost people. They're everywhere that you look. The problem today is found people not reaching and rescuing lost people. I would like to say it this way because I may never be invited back. The problem, <laughs> the problem isn't outside of the building. It's inside the building. The problem isn't the drug dealer. The problem is save people being intimidated by the drug dealer. What I tell my church all the time, get, bring the greatest, biggest drug lord in our city and get him to church because if I can reach him, then I can reach the masses. And, and the only way, the only way the kingdom of God expands are when lost people become found. The only way the kingdom of God grows are when people that do not know him have an encounter with his grace and his goodness that forever changes their life. The problem today isn't outside of the walls. Could the problem be in the room today? See, because I don't, you, maybe you don't know the facts, but there are, a, there are mass amounts of people. There's a mass exodus currently today leaving the church. And it's, and it's not the millennials. People just want to say it's the millennials. No, it's not the millennials. It, it's, it's a mass exodus taking place that are saying that church is irrelevant, the church is not needed, the church no longer has what I need, the, the preaching is not relevant, uh, the music is not relevant. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I come to church, I end up feeling worse about myself than better about myself. And so today there are people all across our nation and world that are running from the very building that I believe they should be doing everything they can to break into. I believe it's the local church, the hope of the world is when you can walk into a building, especially a life-giving church like the one you're planted and see, y'all, y'all spoiled. You think just is how church is everywhere. No, it's not. Sometimes you walk into a church and you think, like, I, I was thinking, like, where's the ceiling at in this room? Where's the, where's the ceiling? Because see, see, you have a perception of church and a reality of church. See, I grew up really straight-laced traditional, so like my view of church was people in suits and ties. And so you have a perception of what church should become, and then reality of what church actually is, right? And so right now we have a mass exodus of people leaving the church, saying that the church is a dinosaur. Saying that if they wanted to be judged, they'll just go to the mall, they're not going to waste their time coming to church. As a matter of fact, I believe sometimes... Churches do a better job of keeping people out than they do bringing people in. Like, when did a church start to operate like TSA? Check your baggage at the door. Like, when, 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 were, when was it only people that looked like you and talked like you that were allowed in the room? When did your sin be okay but their sin not? Because what I can tell you about Christian people, because I am one, is that we have grace for the people that sin like us. But when the moment you meet somebody that does not sin like you, and look like you, and dress like you, and believe like you, that somehow we take the judgment seat of Christ and say, well, you're welcome in, but you got to get right first. But I, I'm the type of person that believes the church door should always be strung wide open. That it should always be open. That there should always be a place where broken people can come, where lost people can come, where dirty, broken people can come, where people that look like you can come, but people that don't look like you can come. People that are saved and people that are lost. The moment that we look around and the whole room is saved, we better go back to the drawing board because that's not why the church exists. And so what I love about Sh Pastor Sean is he's getting ready to launch a third experience in a few weeks. You know what he's doing? He's creating another space for vessels to be filled. And, and can, I, can, I, can I just release you from a little bit of pressure? This church growth, your, the growth of your church has nothing to do with you. It's not your job to grow the church. 
It's his job to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And so I just want you to take a step back and say, all right, guys, it's up to you. He's already done what God's told him to do by creating another space, by creating a, another opportunity for people to come. But it's not going to happen if you don't go gather empty, broken vessels. Why am I screaming? I don't know. I've got to tone it down. But can I, can I, can I tell you, like, I'm, I'm one of these guys that... That I believe, like, like from Genesis to Revelation, all 66 books were pointing to the coming of Jesus Christ. And what I can tell you in the Gospels is that when I study uh, um, uh, miracles take place in the lives of people, it was always on the backbone of activated faith in somebody's life. It was always an activated faith. It took faith, right, for blind Bartimaeus that day, sitting by the roadside, right, hearing that Jesus was coming by. And what, what, did, what did the Bible say? That he shouted. Son of David, have mercy on me. It was in that moment that his circle, shh, be quiet. It's Jesus passing by. But what does the Bible say? He only shouted louder. Why? It was activated faith. He knew that the only chance to get what he had to get was when Jesus was passing by. It was an activated faith. I can think about the woman with the issue of blood. She woke up that day and heard that Jesus was going to be passing by. I don't know how she heard. I don't know if it was on her Facebook notification. I don't know if it was on the local news channel. But I knew somehow she found out that Jesus was coming through her city. And she said, man, now is the moment. This is the time. And it's, it's one thing to go to Jesus, but how, how, how desperate are you to see him? Because the Bible says that she was on her hands and knees, working her way through the crowd. And her face said, if I could just touch the edge or the hem of his garment. In other words, I don't even need to touch his skin. Just give me something that's connected to him. And I have enough faith to believe that the miracle of God will be birthed in my life. Oh, let's, let, let, let's, go, let's go Old Testament. What about, what, what, what about Noah when he's building that ark? In the middle of dry ground. People walking by him think he is crazy. And yet every, every wail of the hammer was activated faith in his heart. Even though he didn't see the first raindrop, he didn't see the first cloud coming in the distance, he only knew that God told him to start laying the hammer and start gathering wood and trucks lined up from Home Depot seven miles out. And all he kept doing was hammering. Do you know how stupid he must have looked? Why are we doing another experience, Sean? We can't even fill two right now. Why are we going to do another one for? Because God spoke to him. And you know what he's doing? He's picking up that hammer. And even though he doesn't see the first person walk through the door in two weeks on a Sunday night at 6 o'clock, he's got that hammer in his hand and he's going to work saying, it's activated faith, God. I know you spoke it. I know you've talked to me. And whether or not it happens, God, it's not up to me. It's up to you. Activated faith. Oh, I love, I love 2 Kings chapter 4. You know, I started thinking about how many empty things God filled. The, the Bible says that the earth was empty and void and without form God created the earth and then he filled it oh he, he created the ark right he built the ark first and then he filled it all oh, we can think about Shadrach Meshach and Abednego in the fiery furnace that day the furnace was empty until faith jumped in and when faith jumped in he filled it with his presence see 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 you can go to the New Testament well, what do you think the womb of a virgin was filled with the presence of God over and over, the, 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 the miracle of the catch, right? The nets were empty, right? And it's not until they threw the nets overboard that he ended up filling the nets. How about the 12 baskets of leftovers? They were empty, and then he filled them over and over. Could it be today that God is saying, church, I want you to understand that I'm a God that is obsessed with filling empty things? And could it just be in a few weeks when you walk into an empty room, it's designed to be filled with people? God is obsessed with filling. Oh, I love Acts in, in, early, in early, early chapters of Acts when he filled the upper room with the Spirit. God was always filling empty, empty spaces and empty people and empty vessels. That's what I love about 2 Kings 4. Uh, the, the prophet comes in and says, what do you have in the house? And, and she responds, nothing. 
Like the first thing that, that, that the response is, why is it in human nature that, that when somebody wants you to get involved or what kind of gifting do you have, why is it that our first response is nothing? I can't sing. I don't have a gift to preach. But can you shake a hand? Oh, you may, you may not be able to shake a hand, but can you rock a, rock a baby in the nursery? No, I hate kids. Well, can, can, you, can, can you work a computer? Because what you're doing every time that you say, yes, I'm going to sign up to serve. Yes, I'm going to do whatever you ask me to, Pastor. Yes, I'm going to do whatever it is that I feel like God is telling me. You know why you high-five somebody? To show them who he is. You know why you rock somebody's baby in the nursery? So that they can see who he is. You know why they put media on the screen? So that it'll help you see who he is. She, she, he goes, what do you have? And she says, it's nothing. And he just kind of gives her the stank eye. Like, really? And she said, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I have a small jar of oil. Can, can I tell you that, 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 that sometimes it's the thing that you overlook inside of you that God wants to use in the greatest way? What I know about Christian people is sometimes we like to hide our scars. We don't want to show people our weakness. We don't want to show people where we came from. We don't want to show people like really what we used to deal with. And so we all have scars. If we're really honest, we all, if we would expose every scar in our life. And what I like about a scar is it's a proof to me that it's a wound that is totally healed. But it's also left on your body to be a sign of the faithfulness of God. And if God saved you and God redeemed you and God brought you out of what you thought you would never get out of, if God set you free, if God delivered you, if God did this and God did that, then God wants to use your story to point to his glory to help somebody else up out of their mess as well. And so, so let me, the first thing I want to tell you is, is, that, is that be a church that, that, that gathers empty vessels. See, Elisha was very, 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 very direct. He said, I need you to go gather empty vessels. And here's the thing that I can tell you about being empty. Is sometimes we, we think that, that all we want God to do is to fill us. And the problem with only being filled once, the oil of God in your life becomes stagnant. Could that be the reason that when you have worship experience like today, you thought, well, that was just okay. But the person three people, three people down from you were worshiping radically and feeling the presence of God. But because you don't stir up that gift that's inside of you, the oil that God wants filled you with has become stagnant in your life. Let me say it this way. Anytime that God fills an empty vessel, it's so that you can pour it out into somebody else's life. When God fills me up with a word, I don't keep the word in. I pour it out. It's, it's the emptiness. It's when we're, we're, we're designed to collect empty vessels. As long as you are a church that, that goes and gathers empty vessels, the oil of God will continue to flow. Can I tell you that what God wants to do in this city, what God wants to do through this church, it's not, he's, it's not up to him. It's up to you. His oil will continue to flow. But the question remains today, will you produce and will you gather and will you present empty vessels so that the oil can continue to flow. Talking about empty vessels. Because what, 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 I, what, I, what I know in my life is that where God brought me from, I've got, I've got so many things that are jacked up in my life that I don't deserve to be doing what I'm doing. I don't deserve the grace that he's given me. But I also fully aware is why he has given me a platform to preach and to travel is because what God has done in my life, that same grace is available to you. The same salvation that I experienced, you can experience today. See, don't, don't buy into the lie of the enemy that you're only designed to be filled once. You're designed to be filled and then go pour it out into somebody else's life. Fill me, pour me. Fill me, pour me. Fill me, God, let me feel your presence, but also, God, give me a platform to be able to communicate your grace to other people. And so when you fill me, I'll pour it out again. And the more that you pour, the greater he fills. The more that you pour, don't ever think that your oil is going to be wasted. Because as long as you're emptying it out, in other words, what you're doing when you pour your oil out, you're investing into somebody else that hasn't experienced the same grace that you experienced. Sometimes it's, 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 it's your greatest mess that God turns into the greatest ministry that your life could ever, ever have imagined. He says, go collect empty vessels so that the oil 
will continue to flow. Here's another thing that we should really look to collect is, is broken vessels. I, I, can, I, I feel like your, your, your church is similar to mine, full of broken people. And so what I can tell you is, is that be obsessed with reaching broken people. Just make it your way of life. What I can tell you is a lot of people look at a broken vessel as a liability. I view it the same way that God does, as an opportunity. Broken vessels and broken people, hear me, this vessel can still contain oil. I've just got to hold it differently. And a lot of times, the reason broken vessels don't contain oil is because we treat it like everybody else. Can, let, let, me just, let, let me just set this room free. Everybody in here at one point of their life is broken. The Bible says Jesus was broken. He was beaten. His body broken for me. See, you, you have the opportunity. I, I believe one of the greatest opportunities is, is taking a broken vessel. I've got to carry it different. I've got to treat it different. I've got to nurture it different. I've got to talk to it different. My grace has got to be bigger for this broken vessel than it does the empty vessel. But I still have the understanding that this broken vessel can still contain oil. What it doesn't need from the local church is saying, get it figured out on your own. And when you get it all done, then come back into the house. That's not the way God designed the church. He designed the church for us to be filled with broken vessels and filled with broken people. It's our job. To position it in the right place, in the right moment, so that the oil of God can continue to flow. Get a can of spiritual flex seal if you need it. They sell it out here. And spray it all over the outside. What I love about broken vessels is that I picture a stained glass window. Some of the most beautiful forms of art was a window that was shattered, painted, and put back together again. I tend to think like that's how God looks at our life. That we're just broken vessels. We're just, we're just broken windows and broken glass that, man, he begins to put his stroke of, of pain on our window and he begins to put and make it beautiful and he begins to place piece by, by piece. And it turns into one of the most beautiful pictures. People come from all over and see those beautiful pieces of artwork, the stained glass windows. That's exactly what God wants to do for your life. He wants to use broken vessels the only way to broken people is through broken people. Be a church that is consumed with reaching broken people. We don't worry about what they look like. We don't worry about what they talk like. We don't worry if they're still living in sin. We don't care if they're serving at our church and they're still, and they're still sleeping around. Yeah, we don't understand it. Yes, we don't really want them to do it. But also we understand that the only way they get better and the only way they get, they get well is to be in the doctor's office. And the moment we keep them outside and don't bring them in, how do they get the medicine that they need for their soul? So... So, so let, me, let, me, let, let, me, let me try to close with this, is that be a church that collects dirty vessels. Dirty vessels. Vessels that, you know, it's one thing to walk into a room and feel like God's grace is good for you, but sometimes you find yourself looking four rows up, three seats down, thinking, my gosh, what is that guy doing in church? He's just dirty. She's just dirty. Our job, can I, can I free you? Your job's not to clean the vessels. Your job's not even to fill the vessels. You know what your job is? Gather. Gather them. And the moment that we all look the same in the room, we no longer are church. We're a cult. Right? What I love about the diversity of the kingdom of God is that is that we all look different, we all have different stories, we all have different seasons. I, I, I just think that like, sometimes we want a church where everybody worships. I don't want a church where everybody worships. I want a church filled with lost people and found people, good people and bad people. I don't want a church that smells like Bath and Body Works. I want a church that smells like gin and juice, man. I want a church where our bathrooms always smell like smoke. And may you also have to be a church where you worship with wine open. Because that joker right beside you might just hack your purse when you've got your eyes closed. 
Can you be a church that reaches empty vessels, broken vessels, and dirty vessels? Can I tell you this as, as I close? That if you present the empty vessel, dirty vessel, and broken vessel under the oil of God, the oil will never cease to stop flowing. What will happen six months from today? Don't wait for his preaching to bring people in. My preaching don't pre bring people in. This worship team's not going to bring people in. Broken people bring broken people in. Dirty people bring dirty people in. Found people bring lost people in. May you be a church that doesn't just wait for your neighbor to do it, but you say, preacher, I'm going to do it. And may next week, that there's only one service, right? What would it be like, church, that people stuck in the parking lot wanting to get in the door? See, you don't, maybe you don't have enough faith to believe for that. I do. I don't even go here, Lizzie. I might. What, what would happen if you would do, what if everybody next week brings five people? Five vessels. Don't go to some other church down the street and take that vessel. <laughs> go find a dirty vessel. You know, you know what it is? The person at your workplace that you can't stand. You know what God's saying? Yeah. That's your dirty vessel. The guy in your neighborhood that don't cut his grass, that's your vessel. Come on, your boss that you can't stand, she's your vessel. That neighbor that you just want to cuss out every time you see him or her, that's your vessel. Find some dirty, broken vessels and get them into the house so the oil of God will continue to flow. Come on, if you receive the word, why don't you give God one big hand clap of praise in the room today. Let me, let me, let me do this. Every head by the right closed across the room today. I want to give you a chance to respond. If there's somebody in the room today that would walk in and say, you know what, preacher, I, I don't have the assurance of salvation. I, I've never given my heart to Christ. I've never made that decision. But I feel like today, man, my heart is stirred. I don't want to let you leave the same way. I'm going to count to three in just a moment. If that's you, if you're here, you need Jesus to save you. Somebody wants you to shoot your hand up when I get to three. I will lead you in a prayer that will assure you of heaven as if you're already standing on those streets of gold. On the count of three, if you need Jesus, I want you to shoot your hand up. One. Two, three, Jesus save me. Yes, yeah, see you, man. Yes, yes. Anyone else? There's a couple hands going up. Anyone else? Don't miss the moment. You're not alone. There's already a few people with their hand raised. Anyone else? Jesus, I need you. I've tried everything, but I need you today. Anyone else? You can join the two guys. Three, I see you in the back. Yes, three. Anyone else? Those of you that have your hands stretched toward heaven, man, that's the greatest decision that you've ever made. <laughs> Would you keep your hands stretched toward heaven? I want to pray for you. Authentic church, I ask you to repeat along with me. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I admit that I am a sinner and I need your grace. Please forgive me of my past, of my present, and of my future sin. I confess today that I will live the rest of my life to glorify your name. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. In Jesus' name that I pray and everybody says amen. Come on, celebrate that, church. Celebrate that. Come on, we have three people cross over from death to life. Come on, there's a party going on in heaven. Come on, why don't you celebrate it for a moment?